In this video, we shall have a brief discussion about anticholinergics. Let us begin with a brief review of the cholinergic receptors. We know that the M1 receptors are present in the autonomic ganglia. Uh, they promote the delivery of impulses. In the central nervous system, stimulation of M1 receptors result in increased learning and memory. In the gastric glands, stimulation of M1 receptors cause increased secretion of HCL. And in the vestibular apparatus, overstimulation of M1 receptors leads to motion sickness. M2 receptors are present in the heart and upon stimulation it causes depression of the myocardium, decreased heart rate, decreased force of contraction and so on. M3 receptors are present in the longitudinal fibers of the ciliary muscle of the eye and upon stimulation it causes contraction of these muscles leading to an opening of the iridocorneal angle, increased drainage of aqueous humor resulting in a fall in the intraocular pressure. M3 receptors are seen in the circular fibers of the ciliary muscle and upon stimulation it causes a net reduction in the radius of the eyeball, relaxation of the lens ligaments and uh, it allows the lens to bulge and there is accommodation of the lens. M3 receptors are present in the vascular endothelium, upon stimulation it causes vasodilatation. They are seen in the exocrine glands and upon stimulation it causes increased output from these glands. They are seen in the beta cells of the pancreas. Upon stimulation, it causes increased secretion of insulin. It is seen in the sphincter pupillae and upon stimulation, it causes constriction of the pupil or meiosis. And finally, they are seen in the smooth muscles of the bronchi and upon stimulation, it will cause bronchoconstriction. NM receptors are present in the neuromuscular junction and NN receptors are again seen in the autonomic ganglia. Now, when we speak about anticholinergic actions, we mostly talk about the anti-muscarinic actions. Now these include such uh, pharmacological actions such as constipation, tachycardia, change in the central nervous system activity that may range from drowsiness to outright delirium, diplopia and dilate pupillar midriasis. There can be dysphagia and dyspnea, urinary retention, decreased secretions, dry hot skin and if the uh, anticholinergic drug has been given in such high doses, death is due to respiratory failure. Now anticholinergic drugs can broadly be classified into receptor blockers and neuron blockers. The vast majority of anticholinergic drugs are receptor blockers. Now these include the muscarinic blockers and the nicotinic blockers. Again, the vast majority of anticholinergic drugs are muscarinic blockers. These, these muscarinic blockers can be classified broadly into two, non-selective and selective drugs. The non-selective drugs include hyoscine and its derivatives which include hyozine, otherwise called scopolamine, hyosiamine, hyocene, butyl bromide and the most important one among them all namely atropine. Now the selective muscarinic blockers are sometimes called the atropine substitutes and they include cycloplegics and midriatics, antispasmodics, M3 blockers used in COPD and asthma, anti-Parkinsonian drugs and pre-anesthetic medication. The cycloplegics and midriatics include cyclopentolate, homotropin, eucotropin and tropicamide. The anticholinergic antispasmodics may be classified broadly into three, those which are devoid of CNS activity like methantoline and propantoline. Urinary antispasmodics like flavoxate, oxybutanine, darifenosine, um, trospium, solifenosine, tolteridine, and others. GI antispasmodics include the well known dicyclamine. M3 blockers used for COPD and asthma may be classified broadly into two short acting muscarinic antagonists like ipratropium and long-acting muscarinic antagonists like thiotropin. 
Anticholinergic anti-Parkinsonian drugs include Benzexol and Benztropine. While the most famous example for an anticholinergic pre-anesthetic medication is glycopyrrolate. Now, the nicotinic blockers. These include NM receptor blockers and NN receptor blockers. Although not classically described as anticholinergic drugs, these are, strictly speaking, anticholinergic. At least they are anti-nicotinic, although they have no anti-muscarinic actions. Now, NM receptor blockers include some neuromuscular blocking agents. Only the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. These are also called the competitive blockers of acetylcholine at NM receptors or concentration dependent blockers of acetylcholine at the NM receptors. These drugs include D-tubicuriare, Vecuronium, Atracurium, Mevacurium, Pancuronium, Rocuronium and so on. NN blockers may be classified into two competitive blockers of acetylcholine at the NN receptor, the example of which is trimethaphan, and others like hexamethonium. Neuron blockers include drugs such as hemicholinium, vesamicol, and botulinum toxin. Right. Let's move on now to the non-selective muscarinic blockers. Non-selective muscarinic blockers include hyoscine and its derivatives. And as discussed earlier, these are the drugs which come under this classification. Hyoscine and, and its derivatives are tropane alkaloids and derived from certain plants. Now, it is true that Atropa belladonna is a source of atropine, but it is not a rich source. The rich sources of atropine are the plants that come under the Datura species. Now, atropine is the classical anticholinergic drug. To be more specific, it is anti-muscarinic. It is a non-selective muscarinic blocker and it will block all muscarinic receptors indiscriminately. Now, this results in a challenge. Because it is true that atropine could potentially be used for many indications. However, since it is non-selective, it produces many unnecessary pharmacological effects as well. This limits the therapeutic indications of atropine. So all those anticholinergic effects that we described earlier, atropine will produce all these effects. So many of these effects will be unwanted. For example, let's take the case of drug-induced Parkinson's disease. It is a well-known fact that anticholinergics are considered the drugs of choice for drug-induced Parkinson's disease. Now, atropine is an anticholinergic drug. Unfortunately, in reality, Atropine is practically never used in patients with drug-induced Parkinson's disease and this is because a patient that has been administered atropine would suffer from adverse effects such as constipation, poor vision because of the dilated pupil and double vision, dysphagia, urinary retention, gait abnormalities and many more. Now all these effects are already present in a patient with Parkinson's disease. Giving atropine to a patient with Parkinson's disease would therefore produce devastating effects. On the other hand, there are substitutes of atropine with greater selectivity in their actions. For example, a drug like benztropine, which is an atropine substitute, can be used in patients with Parkinson's disease, at least with patients with drug-induced Parkinson's disease. Menstropine is far more selective in its actions when compared to atropine. So, the uh, uses of selective atropine substitutes include uh, 
drugs that may be used as cycloplegics and midriatics, antispasmodic drugs, M3 blockers for COPD and asthma, anti-Parkinsonian drugs, and pre-anesthetic medication. Atropine itself is not commonly used for these indications. What then are the indications of atropine? Not the indications of atropine substitutes, but what are the indications of atropine? Now, the uses or indications of atropine are uh, not that many. They can be used in ophthalmology, in cardiology, and in particular in certain uh, emergency department situations, which we call cholinergic crisis, the most famous example of which is organophosphorus poisoning. Atropine can also be used in carbamate poisoning and inocybe poisoning. Atropine is also used as a therapeutic adjunct in certain situations. Now let us look at the ophthalmic uses of atropine. Atropine has got both diagnostic and therapeutic uses in ophthalmology. As a diagnostic tool, atropine is useful in retinoscopy and fundoscopy. As a therapeutic agent, it is useful in iridocyclitis and atropine penalization for treatment of amblyopia, which will be discussed in far greater detail in ophthalmology sessions. Cardiac uses of atropine include symptomatic bradycardia and certain types of heart block. But it should be remembered that atropine is contraindicated in infranodal heart block. But yes, it is indicated for other forms of heart block. Atropine is, used, is also used as a therapeutic adjunct in situations such as myasthenia gravis and cobra envenomation. So these are the uses of atropine in contrast to its many pharmacological actions. Now, to understand the ophthalmological indications of atropine, we need to have a basic knowledge of the anatomy of the eye from the point of view of pharmacology. Now, what you're looking at is a cut section of the eye, and this is the sclera with a structure known as the scleral spur. This would be the cornea and this triangular structure, well at least it is triangular on cut section, this triangular structure is the ciliary body which consists of ciliary muscles. These ciliary muscles are arranged in the form of three fibers. The blue fibers that you are seeing now are the longitudinal fibers of the ciliary muscle. These are the circular fibers of the ciliary muscle. And these are the oblique fibers of the ciliary muscle. All these muscles are seen in the ciliary body. Now, this is the iris. It is the superior iris. And there is the inferior iris. And the space between the superior and inferior irides is called the pupil. Now those green circles that you see are uh, parts of the sphincter pupillae. And this yellow muscle, which has its insertion in the free border of the iris and its origin further superiorly, is called the dilator pupillae. This over here is the lens of the eye, which is attached superiorly and inferiorly by means of the suspensory ligaments. What you just saw is the trabecular meshwork, and a little superior to that is the canal of Schlem. Now, this is the same diagram, but we have also shown the inferior ciliary body with the ciliary muscles as well. Now, that is the superior ciliary body, the longitudinal fibers of the ciliary muscle, and the circular fibers of the ciliary muscle. 
those are the oblique fibers. That is, of course, the iris. That is the sclera. And what you are seeing there is an angle which has been formed between the iris and the cornea. This is what we call the iridocorneal angle. The iridocorneal angle is significant because it is through the iridocorneal angle that aqueous humor leaves the eyeball. When aqueous humor leaves the eyeball, it results in a lowering of the intraocular pressure. Thus, opening up the iridocorneal angle would mean that the aqueous humor would drain better and result in a reduction in the intraocular pressure. Conversely, if the iridocorneal angle is closed, then the aqueous humor will find it very difficult to escape. This results in an increase in intraocular pressure. This, of course, is the sphincter pupillae. And what you are looking at now is the scleral spur, to which the longitudinal fibers of the ciliary muscle have its insertion. Now, this is the circular fibers of the ciliary muscle of the inferior ciliary body. Now, I would encourage you to take a look at the circular fibers of the ciliary muscle of both superior ciliary body and inferior ciliary body. Now, take a look at the circular fibers of the ciliary muscle superiorly now. Remember, this is a cut section. If the eyeball was not then you would have to imagine that these fibers, I'm talking about the uh, circular fibers of the ciliary muscle of the superior ciliary body now. If this was not a cut section, you would have to imagine those fibers to move out of the screen towards your face and then it would take a U-turn downwards and then move away from your face towards the screen and meet the, the, the screen at the lower or inferior ciliary body. From there, the circular fibers of the ciliary muscle of the inferior ciliary body would pierce the screen and move away from your face and then make a U-turn moving upwards and then move towards your face and meet the superior ciliary body. So in fact, this muscle is a circle and we have just cut it like this. So if this muscle were intact and if this muscle were to contract, what would happen is the radius of the eyeball as a whole would reduce. When the radius of the eyeball reduces, the suspensory ligaments that are connected to the lens will relax. And this results in the ability of the lens to bulge anteroposteriorly. Now, M3 receptors are present in the circular fibers of the ciliary muscle. Upon stimulation, the circular fibers of the ciliary muscles will contract. The lens ligaments will relax and the lens bulges anteroposteriorly. And this is how accommodation of the lens occurs. Now, Looking back at this diagram, let us now shift our focus to the sphincter pupillae. As you can see, the sphincter pupillae is present in the superior iris and it is present on the inferior iris as well. Now, I encourage you to look at the sphincter pupillae of the superior iris. Again, this is a cut section and if the eye was not cut and this muscle was intact, 
then you would have to imagine the sphincter pupillae of the superior iris to move out of the slide or out of the screen towards your face, take a U-turn downwards and then move away from your face towards the screen to meet the screen at the inferior iris and then to penetrate the screen and move away from your face, make a U-turn upwards and then move towards your face and meet the superior iris. Thus, it is also in the shape of a circle and when it contracts, the, the pupil will reduce in size and that is how meiosis occurs. Right. Now, let us try to make sense of what happens when M3 receptors in the eye are stimulated. Now, M3 receptors are present in the longitudinal fibers of the ciliary muscle. We saw that the longitudinal fibers of the ciliary muscle are attached to the scleral spur. When these muscles contract, they cause the insertion to move towards the origin and this means that the iridocorneal angle would open up. So opening of the iridocorneal angle would increase drainage of aqueous humor resulting in fall in the intraocular pressure. M3 receptors are present in the circular fibers of the ciliary muscle and upon contraction it results in a reduction in the overall radius of the eyeball, the lens ligaments relax, the lens bulges and there is a combination of the lens. M3 receptors are also present in the sphincter pupillae and upon stimulation it causes meiosis. Atropine is a non-selective muscarinic blocker and therefore it would block M3 receptors not just in the eye but everywhere else. So what would happen if we instilled atropine into the eye? It would block the M3 receptors in the longitudinal fibers of the ciliary muscle causing the iridocorneal angle to become uh, more closed. And this uh, results in a decreased drainage of aqueous humor resulting in an increase in the intraocular pressure. Atropine would block the M3 receptors in the circular fibers of the ciliary muscle and therefore accommodation of the lens is lost. Weakness of the circular fibers of the ciliary muscle is called cycloplegia. Finally, by blocking M3 receptors in the sphincter pupillae, atropine results in midriasis. Thus in the eye, atropine increases the intraocular pressure and therefore is obviously contraindicated in glaucoma. It causes cycloplegia and midriasis. So, atropine has got two important uses in ophthalmology. It is used in fundoscopy and in retinoscopy. Fundoscopy is also known as ophthalmoscopy and it is performed using an ophthalmoscope and we do this to visualize the fundus of the eye. Retinoscopy is performed using a retinoscope and it is used to diagnose refractive errors of the eye. It is worth noting that atropine is the most potent cycloplegic currently available. However, its peak action can be delayed by up to three days and the duration of action may persist for up to two weeks. Because of these issues with atropine, it is not routinely used for fundoscopy or retinoscopy, but it may have a role. It does have a role when patients' pupils fail to dilate sufficiently in the clinic with other routinely used cycloplegics and mitriatics. Yes, so therapeutic uses of atropine include iridocyclitis, uh, a condition where the iris and the ciliary muscle get inflamed. So when we give atropine, these muscles fail to contract continuously and therefore we can give rest to the ciliary muscle and the iris. 
It is also given for atropine penalization for the treatment of amblyopia, which will be dealt in far more detail in ophthalmology lectures. As mentioned, atropine can be used for symptomatic bradycardia and for heart block and the goal of administration of atropine in heart block is to improve conduction through the atrioventricular nod. Now this is only effective if the site of block is within the AV nod and if it is an infranodal block, atropine may actually worsen the condition. At any rate, long term medical therapy is not indicated in AV block, cardiac pacing is the therapy of choice. The use of atropine and organophosphorus poisoning will be discussed in a separate video. And regarding atropine as a therapeutic adjunct, we mentioned that atropine can be used as an adjunct in myasthenia gravis and in cobra envenomation. The pyridostigmine is used in myasthenia gravis and neostigmine is given in cobra envenomation. Both these drugs act by blocking acetylcholine esterase enzyme and increasing the amount of acetylcholine available to bind to the nicotinic NM receptors, thus improving uh, stimulation of NM receptors and hopefully uh, increasing the respiratory capacity, increasing the ability of the patient to breathe. However, there will also be excess acetylcholine available to bind to the muscarinic receptors. In these conditions, Mycena gravis and cobra bite, any stimulation of muscarinic receptors is completely useless and will only produce unwanted adverse effects. Now, if we remember, atropine is a non-selective muscarinic blocker and it will leave the nicotinic receptors alone. Thus, addition of small amounts of atropine to cholinesterase inhibitors like pyridostigmine or neostigmine would prevent the excess acetylcholine from stimulating muscarinic receptors and allow the excess acetylcholine to continue stimulating the nicotinic receptors. The score administration of small doses of atropine help counter the muscarinic adverse effects of anticholinesterases and that explains why atropine can be used as a therapeutic adjunct in myasthenia gravis and in cobra bite envenomation. Now regarding hyozine and related compounds, hyozine is also known as scopolamine, crosses the blood brain barrier and is commonly used for the treatment of nausea and vomiting and more importantly for the prophylaxis of motion sickness. Hyocyamine also crosses the blood brain barrier and is useful as an adjunctive therapy for peptic ulcer disease, irritable bowel syndrome and hypermotility of the lower urinary tract. HBB or hyacinth butyl bromide does not cross the blood brain barrier and is commonly used as a GI antispasmodic. Yes, now, regarding atropine substitutes, selective atropine substitutes, as we saw earlier, these can be classified into the cycloplegics and midriatics, the antispasmodics, drugs used for COPD and asthma, anti-Parkinsonian drugs, and pre-anesthetic medication. Regarding the cycloplegics and midriatics, we saw that the examples include cyclopentylate, homotropin, eucotropin, and tropicamide, and these drugs have got a faster onset of action than atropine and have got a shorter duration of action when compared to atropine. And among these, tropicamide has the shortest duration of action, hardly six hours. And that makes it a very popular choice for uh, routine fundoscopy. Among the antispasmodics, we saw that there are antispasmodics devoid of CNS effects like methantheline and propantheline. There are urinary antispasmodics like flavoxate, darifenosine, oxybutynin, trospium, tolteridine, and solifenosine. And there is dicyclomine, the GI antispasmodic. 
we saw that M3 blockers are used for COPD and asthma. In fact, they are probably more effective for COPD than they are for asthma. We saw that there are long acting muscarinic antagonists like thiotropium and short acting muscarinic antagonists like ipratropium and oxytropium. We saw that um, thiotropium is useful as an add-on therapy if asthma patients remain uncontrolled despite moderate to high dose usage of inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta-2 agonist combinations. And as we mentioned earlier, these drugs, the anticholinergic drugs, would probably be better for COPD um, than asthma. Now, regarding drug-induced Parkinson's disease, for the smooth and smooth execution of a planned and coordinated movement, acetylcholine and dopamine should be present in adequate amounts and in a dynamic balance. When this balance is lost, the result is Parkinson's disease. When there is a relative deficiency of dopamine or an excess of acetylcholine or a combination of both, um, Parkinson's disease can develop. So the therapeutic approaches in Parkinson's disease would be to reduce the excessive cholinergic activity by giving anticholinergic drugs, by increasing the dopaminergic activity by giving dopaminergic drugs and other options. Right, so the anti-Parkinsonian drugs, which are anticholinergic in nature, include benztropine, benzhexol, and benzhexol is also called trihexyphenidyl. Now, regarding pre-anesthetic medications, the example is glycopyrrolate. Now, patients under general anesthesia will have a poor cough reflex, and these patients are at grave danger of developing aspiration pneumonia. Administration of glycopyrrolate is beneficial since it will block M3 receptors in exocrine glands and this will reduce secretions from these glands and therefore reduce the risk of aspiration. Unlike atropine, glycopyrrolate penetrates the blood-brain barrier poorly and is therefore largely devoid of central effects. Glycopyrrolate is commonly prescribed prior to the induction of general anesthesia and it is done as a part of pre-anesthetic medication or pre-medication. Let us now move on to the nicotinic blockers. These include the NM blockers, for which there are many examples, and they include D-tubercurare, Vecuronium, Atracurium, Cis-Atracurium, Mivacurum, Pancuronium, and Rocuronium. These drugs will be dealt with in greater detail when we discuss about neuromuscular blocking agents, otherwise called peripherally acting skeletal muscle relaxants. These drugs are used to produce complete and total immobility during surgeries or other unpleasant procedures. Such patients will not be able to move uh, most of the muscles in their body, including the muscles of respiration like the diaphragm, and therefore such patients will have to be artificially ventilated. Such drugs are commonly administered as a part of balanced anesthesia, which we will deal with later. Now the NN blockers, now these may be classified, as we said earlier, into competitive inhibitors of acetylcholine, like trimethophan and others like hexamethonia. It's worth noting that trimethophan is considered as an antidote for nicotine poisoning. Yeah, so we've completed the receptor blockers. Now we move on to the neuron blockers. Now let us first see how acetylcholine is normally synthesized in a cholinergic neuron. Let us say that this is a cholinergic nerve terminal. The entire process begins when choline is taken up by a transporter and combines with acetyl-CoA to form acetylcholine. Acetylcholine needs to be stored in a 
a vesicle, in a storage vesicle, otherwise it will get destroyed very quickly. So, here is the storage vesicle and acetylcholine is stored in it. Upon stimulation of this cholinergic nerve terminal, voltage sensitive calcium channels open up. The entry of calcium causes exocytosis of acetylcholine. So, this is the normal state of affairs in a cholinergic neuron. Now, there is a drug called hemicholinium which will block the transporter responsible for uh, getting choline into the cholinergic neuron. So, hemicholinium is an anticholinergic drug. It is a neuron blocker. Again, there is another drug that will prevent the vesicular uptake of acetylcholine into the storage vesicle. That drug is called vesamicol. Also, there are drugs that will prevent the calcium channels from opening up and if calcium doesn't enter, acetylcholine cannot get exocytosed. So, blockers of the voltage sensitive so calcium channels include the aminoglycoside antibiotics. And finally, we have botulinum toxin which can inhibit the uh, release of acetylcholine directly. So, that would conclude our discussion on anticholinergic drugs.